Hi, my name is Sika. Welcome to today's service. We are so excited to have you joining us this morning. So if you haven't already, like and share this post. Um, if you're on YouTube um, or Facebook watching, it's really a great way to, to offer some hope for someone this morning. And most of all, we'd love to have you engaging in the comments during the sermon. So whether it's during the worship, if, the, you know, if you're connecting with the worship, go ahead and just engage in the comments during the sermon. Um, just engage. We, we want to feel that sense of community, even though we're not able to physically be with each other this morning. And for guests, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're so glad to have you joining us. If you can follow the link in the comments to fill out the guest card, while we're online, we will donate $5 to stop human trafficking on your behalf. Um, if you fill out that guest form while, while the service is um, happening. And um, some announcements this morning. So one is that we have Pie with the Pastors coming up. So it's going to be on Sunday, July 11th at 5 p.m. So this is a really, really cool way to get to meet Matthew and Laura and learn some more about the hills, our community, our mission, our history. So if you've never been to their home, even if you've been at church for like six months, a year, it's the perfect chance to get to spend some time with them and learn some more about our community. Um, I've heard the pie is great. I actually haven't been myself, so maybe I should go this time. But <laughs> um, and I've been at the hills for a bit. Um, but yes, it's a great way to, to get to meet them. And so, you know, it's at 5 p.m. Um, follow the link in the comments. Uh, to RSVP so that we just know how many folks will be joining. And then second is that we have the mega sports camp happening at the end of July. So it's running from July 20th to 23rd. We're really excited. We couldn't have it last year because of COVID. And so we're really excited that we get to offer it this year. It's a great chance for kids to play sports, be out, running about, having fun, meeting other kids in the neighborhood. We have about 50 kids signed up so far. So, you know, if you haven't signed up for Kid yet, please follow the link in the comments and do so. It's free. Invite your friends, invite your neighbors. Um, and yeah, um, it's an opportunity for the kids to, to just get to meet each other. And um, second thing is that we're still looking for volunteers. So this is it's a quite a big, a big deal, you know, 50 kids. Um, we want to make sure we're serving them as well as possible. So we need um, a few more volunteers. So if you have any time at all during that week, it runs from the Tuesday to Friday of that week, July 20th to the 23rd. Follow the link again in the comments for more information on how you can um, serve during that week. We would love to have you joining us. You do not need to be athletic to be a volunteer. So um, definitely, definitely check it out. And then the last thing is micro churches have been ongoing um, for a couple of weeks now, but it's not too late to join if you haven't been able to do so, but you're interested in kind of figuring out like, what is this micro church thing? And um, you know, how is it different from usual church? Um, we really encourage you to check it out. Um, if you go to our website, there will be more information. I love my micro church. Um, it's been a real blessing during the pandemic being part of one and getting to connect with kind of a small group of people and do community while we're all stuck at home. So yes, follow the link now. You know, we're out and about. We're meeting in parks and the weather has been nice. So um, yeah, uh, sign up if you haven't. So that's all I have for comments this morning. We just ask you to prepare your hearts for the sermon and happy, happy Sunday. Bye. Hills Church, what's up? How y'all doing this morning? Y'all chilling? Uh, welcome. So glad you de uh, decided to join us this morning here at the Hills Church. My name is Najee, the worship pastor here at the Hills. So glad um, and elated and happy and privileged that you <laughs> are worshiping with us this morning. Uh, I got a question for y'all. What do you have coming up on your schedule? What do you have planned this coming week? Monday, Tuesday, like, 
Some playing with the family, some playing for work, travels, uh, upcoming month. Like, what's, what's on the agenda? My wife and I were praying the other day. My wife said something, my beautiful, wonderful, amazing wife, Taylor Alexis the Great. Uh, she said, God, we want to know your agenda. I said, ooh, that's, that's good. And I said, Lord, what's on your calendar? Have you ever thought about that? God, what is on your calendar? What is something that you want to get done? And we were saying that we're, we, we become so bogged down with stuff to do. We become so busy with stuff to do. And I mean, and it's something that we kind of, ref- that all of us humans reflect on every so often. We just come so busy just doing stuff. I've heard this thing, or I've heard a few people say that we're not human doings, we're human beings. <laughs> so sometimes it's good just to be. That's that's deep. I don't even know how to, you know, you know, to, to really decipher that right now. However, I just want to ask, like, what are you, what's on your calendar? And after we were praying that this uh, scripture hit my heart, it says, uh, it's Isaiah 55 and 6. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man in his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Verse 8 says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And that was Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 8, I believe. Yeah, verses 6 through 9. I was like, man, that's good. Like, God, you do things sometimes that I just don't even understand. All things work together for the good of those that love the Lord. Like, sure. Like, how many times have we heard that? And our most, you know, hurtful and painstaking times. Like, how many times has somebody said that or that scripture come to our heads? Like, God, what are you doing? Sometimes it's good to step back and say, God, what's on your agenda? Can you use me as a vessel to finish your plan? We usually have Elora and Matt up here or acoustic maybe a few other singers uh, but I just I just felt like we should just take out this time to kind of it's like our unplugged unplugged if you've been to our services uh, when we were meeting uh, we used to have unplugged services you know where we take out the bass and the drums do cajon so whatever this may mean to you think about that let's sing this song at the king of my be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, cause you are good, good. You are good, good. Oh, you are good. You're good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, that's the king of my heart. Be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he 
is my song Let the King of my heart Be the fire inside my veins The echo of my days Oh, is my song For you are good You're good You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down No, no, no You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let Come on church, sing that out where you are Oh, you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down oh, You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down oh, You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down oh, You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down For you are good
not only are you good, but you're great. Who then sings my song, my Savior God, my God to thee. How great thou got something on your agenda right now, take it off. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have your way, God. Have your way in this place. Have your way. Have your way. Take over. <laughs> That's my prayer, Lord. Take over. Oh, take over. No matter what's happening. Oh, God, take over. Oh, take over. Good, yeah. Yes, you are God. Oh, you are good. You're good. Oh, for you are good. Hey, welcome to the Hills Church, everyone. I'm Matthew, one of the pastors here, and I just want to uh, piggyback a little bit on what Najee was, was saying during, during worship about creating that, that space. And, and we're, we're coming out of the pandemic, and, and now what might happen is that we go back to the way things were just before or before the pandemic, where our, our schedules were packed, we were just, just going, just everything was, was filled up, and, and I think... That would be, uh, I think that would be a mistake. Like, I, I think we need to keep that space, keep, it, and what Najee was saying about finding God's agenda, seeking God, being a people of the presence of God. And so, Najee, thanks for reminding us of that today. And so the, the challenge is, and, and I know, like, it's nice out, but, but really, it's, it's too hot to be outside, right? It's been, it's been incredibly hot. We're melting out there, uh, melting here. Like, the, the air conditioner doesn't keep up in, in the house. Um, so what are, you, what are you doing? What are you doing to create that space and spending time in, in God's presence and, and seeking God. So I hope you were encouraged and also challenged in that this morning. Uh, before we dive into the word, we do want to do our, our check-in question and, and related to the pandemic and everything opening up. Put it here in the comments for us just, just to get chatting a little bit and, and so we can see who's, who's with us and say hi to one another. Uh, but put it in the comments there. What is one thing that you've done recently that you hadn't done in the last year? What is one thing that you have done recently that you haven't done in the last year because of the pandemic? And, and uh, some of you I'm friends with, and so we've, we've chatted about things you've been able to do. 
I recently went back to the movie theater for the first time. I took uh, Britt, our 10-year-old son, I took him to see a classic Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark was playing. Uh, Hawkins Theater does a, um, like a, a weekly kind of classic movie. Uh, but put, put that in, in, the, in the comments, um, some, something you've done recently, and it's just like, yeah, it's nice to get back to some, some normalcy. Um, now, as we prepare to begin meeting together regularly in September, I, I think it'd be good for us to pause and to, be, and to consider just do some self-reflection as a church. Like, what, what kind of church do we want to be? Like, what, what kind of, of people, what kind of community is the Hills Church going to be? Like, who, uh, maybe the question for today is, who is welcome at the Hills Church? Who is welcome at the Hills Church? So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 15. Luke chapter 15. And we're going to start, and we're just going to read the first couple verses today. So Luke 15. Verse 1. So now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Now, we could stop right there. I'm not going to talk about that part, but apparently they wanted to be around Jesus. And that, that is so telling. Verse 2. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would give me clarity of thought, you would give me ease of expression, and that you'd open up our hearts to hear what your Spirit is saying. God, that you would use uh, these words, these, these next 20, 25 minutes, in a way that would form us, in a way that would shape us, a way that would speak to us. So we invite you to come. And make your word come alive in us. May it come alive in me. In your name I pray, amen, amen. The Pharisees, what are they doing? They are muttering. Have you, have you ever muttered? Have you, have you ever been in, around someone who is a mutterer just kind of talking under their breath and talking sideways? And, and the religious leaders, they are muttering about Jesus and the company that Jesus is keeping. And, and in response, Jesus doesn't tell them like, hey, cut that out. You should do this instead. Jesus is telling stories all the time. He's, he's sharing parables. He, he wants to put it in a picture and, and paint a picture of what the kingdom of heaven is like. And then he invites us into that kingdom. So in, in any parable, it's always helpful to meditate on uh, the images and, and the metaphors in the parable. And so in this, in this parable today, what I want us to look at are, are three images. The sheep, the search, and the shepherd. We're going to look at the sheep, the search, and the shepherd. So first, the sheep. Now, throughout Scripture, the people of God are, are, are um, called the sheep. And we see this in the Psalms where, where the psalmist says that we are his, we are the sheep of his pasture. Of course, Psalm 23 talks about the, the, the shepherd leading us beside the calm waters and the, and the green pastures. And Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And so he, he calls us, he calls us uh, sheep. And now, but sheep, generally speaking, are not the brightest. They're not the brightest of, of creatures. And, and when you think of a smart animal, in fact, in the comments, just put in there, like, a smart animal, your, your top three smart animals. Elephant. Uh, elephant. Najee says elephant. Apparently, they, they have a, uh, like, a photogenic memory or something like that. Uh, dogs, animals that you can train. Now, sheep, not in the top three. Just, just the opposite. I mean, sheep, they are, they are dense. They are dependent. They are defenseless. And one put, person put it this way. A sheep is a stupid animal. It loses its direction continually in a way that a cat or dog never does. And even when you find a lost sheep, the lost sheep brushes to and fro and will not follow you home. So when you find it, you must seize it throw it to the ground, tie its four legs, 
and hind legs together, throw it over your shoulder and carry it home. That's the only way to save a lost sheep. So what, I mean, what is the lesson Jesus is trying to tell us about ourselves by calling his people sheep? One, I think he's trying to tell us that we need to be rescued. We are a people who need to be rescued. Now, when a sheep is lost, it cannot find its way home. A dog will usually find its way home. A cat can find its way home. But a sheep, it's, it's hopeless. It's just wandering. In fact, when a sheep sees grass, when it sees green grass, like it goes to the grass no matter what the cost. And no matter what the danger, it's just not like if it's on a steep slope, on a, on a hill, like it tries to get there sometimes, causing it to fall, sometimes falling to its own death. And it, the, uh, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, I think he knew something about sheep because he put it like this. He said, we all like sheep. We're like sheep that have gone astray. We have turned to our own way. And, uh, and, and sheep, uh, I've been... I've been to a few rodeos, and they do the, I think it's called mutton busting, where they put the little kid on, on the sheep, and they, they <laughs> ride the sheep, and they fall off, and uh, it's kind of cute. But the, the way they, they get the, the sheep backed with where they want it to go is they bring out some other sheep, and, and they just kind of follow the, the leader. And a sheep will follow another sheep, even into its own demise. In fact, in 2005, just to give you a real life example. In 2005, there were herdsmen, there were shepherds in Turkey. And to their horror, they watched as 1,500 sheep jumped off a cliff. And it started, they were, they were, the, the shepherds, they were finishing the breakfast, and they noticed that one of the sheep was, was wandering towards the cliff, got too close, stumbled over, and fell to its death. Shortly after, the, the and there was nothing they could do, just one after another, all 1,500 of the sheep went off the cliff. Now, I heard this story, and I was like, no, nah, that can't be true. I got it. I'm going to have to Google that. Google it. it was, I saw it on BBC and a, a few other news uh, stories. Now, not all 1,500 of them died. Only the first, like 450 of them died, because as the other ones jumped, there was more padding, and they fell on the... Like, that just shows you something about sheep. It reminds me of the 18th century hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, which there's a line that says, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And that's, that's us. That's you. That's, that's me. And we need rescue. We need rescue. But not only that, the second thing I, I think about the metaphor of sheep, it teaches us is that just how thoroughly we need rescue. So if you're, if you're taking notes, you're writing down, like you write down sheep, you put, we need rescue. And then uh, number two under that is, no, no, seriously, we thoroughly need rescue. Uh, in fact, here's a, I was going to show you a short clip of a sheep that has been rescued. And watch what the sheep does after its rescue. So, so check it out. It's, it gets out, rescued. Two seconds later, where is it? Right back in the pit. That, I mean, it, it's not enough to, to even to find the lost sheep. It won't follow you home. It has, to be, it has to be captured. It has to be tied up. It has to be thrown over the shoulders and carried home. I mean, how did Jesus describe it? He said the shepherd put it over the shoulders and went home. Because the sheep, even once they're found, they want to wander. They want to go off again. Now, this is much, much different than, uh, say, when, when a dog is found, a dog and the dog's owner, the dog's human are found. About uh, 13 years ago, I worked for a, a short period of time as an animal control officer. I was, I was animal control. In fact, I was trained in the ancient art of the catch pole. Uh, you, you've seen like the catch pole and it's got the loop in the end and you, you pull it. And so it was just me and the catch pole. There was a, a man in this catch pole and I was, I was patrolling this, the streets looking for any stray dogs. That, um, and, and almost uh, 100% of the time, we were able to reunite the dog with the dog's human. Uh, and and if, it, if it had been a while, like when the dog saw the human, the dog, you know, goes crazy, tails wagging, and they're jumping up and down, kind of crying, got a bark, kind of cry, and, uh, and everyone's happy. And the owner at that point can just kind of like point to the car and the dog right in. Or if it was close to home, we were, we, we were close to where the, the dog lived. The same thing, the owner was like, you know, just pointed the right. You can't do that with a sheep. Like there, there is no, there are no halfway measures. And, and I never, you know, my time as an animal control officer, 
I never had to corral a lost sheep. Uh, a marmot <laughs> one time got stuck up under an engine. That's another story. Uh, but never, never a sheep. And sheep, they are just so utterly lost that they can contribute nothing to their salvation. You see, you see where we're going? So you see where we're going? They can contribute nothing to their salvation. The shepherd has to do everything for the sheep. The, the shepherd can't bring the sheep halfway home and say, okay, you got it from, from here. No, there is no cooperation on behalf of the sheep. And so we are so utterly lost in our sin, and there is nothing we can do to contribute to our salvation. We are saved completely by the work of our Savior. And, and Jesus, so this tells me a couple of things. One, that Jesus, he's more than just a good teacher. More than just someone to teach us some good life lessons and, you know, just, it, he's more than just an inspirational example to follow because that won't get us home. Yeah. That doesn't get us home. That doesn't get us to where we need to be. We needed a savior, one who lived righteously but died unjustly. That's our savior. He lived righteously. He died unjustly. One who received our due recompense. Now, what we're kind of getting at here is a... Um, kind of a, a Bible concept that is, is fallen out of a favor in, in today's world, both outside the church and even inside the church. We, and we call it original sin. Uh, it, I mean, most people, when we talk about original sin, get very suspicious. But scripture teaches us that we are all, we are given to sin. It's, it's our disposition. It's, it's offensive because of the implications because if, if original sin is true and our, our, our hearts are inclined to sin, then we cannot participate in our salvation. We cannot participate. And um, there was, uh, so the Enlightenment, and we're not going to go into a whole lot of like what the Enlightenment was, but in the 1700s, there was a number of, of thinkers, and, and one of them was uh, the French philosopher Rousseau. And, and Rousseau rejected the doctrine of original sin as did many people of that time and many people of our time. And he said, there is no original perversity in the human heart. Like the, the, the heart is, is not, it's not, it's not inclined towards, towards sin. And we, a couple hundred years later, whether we want to accept it or not, we are products of the enlightenment. Like we are, we are products, it's just been handed to us, whether, whether you know it or not. And basically the enlightenment one of the teachings of the Enlightenment was that we are, we're essentially good. And I think most Denverites would agree. Most, most folks would agree. And, it, and to be clear, I'm not saying you can't be a good neighbor or that you're as bad as you, you could possibly be. And then we have to be incredibly careful not to categorize people. Because that's the, what the Pharisees were doing, right? They were saying like, this group is in, this group is not. And so this, this doctrine of original sin can be twisted and it can be used incorrectly. Um, but the Apostle Paul put it this way. When he was talking about himself, when he looked inside himself and he, he said, I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Like Paul had realized like there was a struggle within him. And it, he's like, I want to do right. I, I want to do good, but there's something holding me back. There is something holding me back. And another way maybe of just looking at original sin is, is to think like we, we're broken. We are broken. And I mean, just take a look, take a look at the world. Like when you, when you have global terrorism, when you have the murders of the George Floyds and the Ahmed Aubrey's of the world, when we see the conflicts in the Middle East, it's escalating again. When we see the crisis, at our border, when we see the cartels gaining power again and, and trafficking drugs, trafficking people, we see our political leaders who continually bow at the feet of the highest bidder, right? So that, but that's all out there. But then we look in, internally. We look into our own hearts, and it's not much different. Like, even if, like, on the surface, like, things are pretty good, like, why, why, do, I, why do I react that way? Why do I have a short fuse? Why do I get so upset? Why do I, uh, why do I dehumanize the person I disagree with or the, the party I, I disagree with? And why don't I speak up? Why don't I have the courage to say something when something needs to be said? Why do I lack grace? Why do I seek people's uh, approval? It, 
and causes, causes me to lie, like all, all these internal things. And we find ourselves in a uh, conundrum. We, we find ourselves in a conundrum. Like there, so there, there was um, about 70 years ago, 60 years ago, the, uh, so the U.S. Has, has, the United States has what they call like the, the top poet or the poet laureate. And, and there was one of the poets right after World War II, about 10 years after that, his name was Randall Jarrell. He wrote this. He said, most of us know now that Rousseau was wrong and that man, when you knock his chains off, sets up death camps. Soon we shall know everything the 18th century didn't know and nothing it did and it will be hard to live with us. So he's speaking shortly after World War II because before World War I and World War II at the, at the turn of the, um, the 20th century, the early 1900s, there was this idea brought on by the Enlightenment that it was just progress and, and the human race was moving forward and we were evolving and, and things were looking up. And then we had two world wars and then we had the concentration camps. And, it, and so if it, it just showed how bankrupt the idea is that, that we were headed on this, this track of, of progress. Now, we don't want to believe we're sinful. That's, you know, that's, that's repugnant. That's, it's very judgmental. It's so medieval of us, right? Yet, we look at the evidence around us, and what else are we to conclude? Like, the world has gone very wrong. If, if there was nothing wrong with the human condition, then why are people out protesting? Because... Like, because we understand that something is wrong. And, and we have no answers except Scripture gives us the answer. And, and the answer is that we are thoroughly in need of a Savior. We are thoroughly in need of a Savior. And, um, and if you don't think you are, just give us some time. Because <laughs> there will come a point where you're like, man, I, I am not who I thought I was. So that's, that's what the sheep teaches us in this parable. We need rescuing. And, and now I just want to look at the search. There, there's a search that happens in this passage. And, and what does the search teach us? And, and the search reminds us, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get hustling through this. I went a little long in that one. But the search reminds us that we are a community of grace, that we are bonded together as recipients of grace, that we have been through death and now we come through life together and there is no stronger bond. And so remember the context uh, of the Jesus. He, he was not just like scrolling through his, his notes or his phone, like, what am I going to teach today? What, what can these folks use? No, he was responding to a real life situation. The Pharisees, um, they, were, they were muttering. They were concerned about who was part of Jesus' community. And I don't mean community in the broad sense, but like who was part of his specific community, who he was inviting in, uh, into his personal space and, and, to, and, and the people he was inviting in were often excluded from religious activities. I mean, because when you think about a faith community, you think about people who are trying to obey God and trying to live moral and, and do right. And yet in Jesus' community, here are sinners and tax collectors who obviously were not obeying God. They, did, they didn't act right, and they, they shouldn't have been welcomed, according to the Pharisees. And to the religious leaders, the sinners were a problem. The sinners were a problem, but to Jesus, the sinners were his purpose. You, you see the difference there? Like, yeah. for the Pharisees, a problem. For Jesus, his very purpose for coming. And so, the, the shepherd here that goes after the sheep, this isn't just like a haphazard uh, where's my sheep? Here's sheep. But this is a, a, an intense, like I've lost my sheep. I'm searching for my sheep and I'm going to search until the sheep is found and brought home. It, and, and Jesus, he's trying to get the Pharisees to see the type of community. He's trying to give them a picture of the kingdom of heaven. And that's why he gives them these parables because they're, they're, when you have grace, it, it forms community. It, it's a community of joy and, and rejoicing. I mean, look at, at verse 5 and verse 6 and verse 7. Every one of them talk about joy and rejoicing. He says when he finds the sheep, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and, and then he gathers his neighbors. He says, rejoice with me. And then he says, 
what happens in heaven when a sinner repents is, is there's rejoicing in heaven. And now we kind of read over that part and don't think about it too much, but Jesus is saying, and it's quite the claim, that he knows what heaven is like. Like who else, who else can make that claim and we're not like, ah, oh, yeah, you're, you're a, little, a little off the rocker. Uh, no, but Jesus makes this claim that he knows what heaven is like and, and he says the kingdom of heaven celebrates the sinners who find grace and it doesn't celebrate the righteous who don't think they need to repent. And so what, what type of community are we at the Hills Church? What type of community are, are we gonna be? I and mean, what are we gonna celebrate at the Hills Church? Are we the type of community who, who mumbles at the type of sheep in the fold? Wow. Are, we, are we the type of community who, who like, oh, you know, like muttering, like, what? what? Why are they here? I mean, pick your category of, of people who you think don't belong or aren't welcome. That's who, who Jesus welcomes. That's who Jesus invites in. And, and the Pharisees, they had not experienced God's grace. And so there was no joy when the sinners and the tax collectors were welcomed in. Because those who have really experienced grace, like we know we, we don't deserve this. We know we don't deserve an invitation. And so when others are brought in, we're like, yeah, you too, come on in. Like this isn't just for me, this is for you too. And so, right. and so we rejoice, we rejoice. And so, you know, there may be some, some Sundays, there may be some micro churches where, where someone makes a comment and you're like, oh, that's, that's not, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> like, I don't want to be associated with that comment, and like, do they know this person's here at the church, or they know the way this person's living, or do they know this person's lifestyle, and, and, and my, my prayer would be, like, maybe you, you happen to join us today, and you have felt that unwelcome at a, a church in the past, and, and if that's your story, I, I sincerely apologize and if you have felt that at the Hills Church, I want to assure you that that is not the way of our Savior. That, that, that's because we're still broken as well. And we will, we will call that out and we will repent of that. And so, but let's rejoice. Let's be the kind of church that rejoices over the one who repents. And we are those who are lost and have been found by our Savior, and we are a community of joyful grace. And, and I just want to conclude by looking at the shepherd. We looked at the sheep, we looked at the search, and I want to look at the shepherd just for a moment. And, and Jesus, in this passage, he is the unspoken shepherd. Of course, there's in other places, he calls himself the good shepherd in the Gospel of John, and he is the one who goes after the lost sheep. Now, the thing about a shepherd is the shepherd is not a consultant to the sheep. The shepherd has full control over the sheep. And it, it, so it's, it's not like Jesus is like, hey, hey, sh hey sheep, <laughs> like what, what should we do today? What do, you, what do you want me to do? Like what do you want from, from me? And no, no, the shepherd, the shepherd guides and the shepherd directs and the shepherd leads the sheep to where he wants them. <clears throat> Well, that's hard because we want to be we want to be in control and there was there is a um, you know you might be thinking like well what right does Jesus have to be our shepherd like what what right does he have to, to have say over our lives there you may or may not be familiar with the um, the Jewish celebration of Passover. Uh, Passover was to commemorate, it was given to the people of Israel by God, and it was to, to celebrate and commemorate that God had brought the children of Israel out of 400 years of slavery. For 400 years they had been slaves, and God delivered them with 10 plagues. And the last plague was going to be a visit from the death angel. And the only way to be saved from the death angel, and God gave them these instructions ahead of time, was to sacrifice a lamb. And to take the blood from the lamb and, and to wipe it on the doorpost and to wipe it on the top of the door. And then when the death angel came, the angel would see the blood and would pass over the house. And those who were under the blood were saved. And Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, the night that he was taken, he was celebrating the Passover with his disciples. 
But you know what's, when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those, those, three, those three gospels, there is, there is mention of bread, there's mention of wine, but there is no mention of a lamb. Like you, you can't have a Passover meal without the lamb. Like it, it, it doesn't work. And, and there was no lamb on the table, but there was a lamb at the table. That's good. Because our shepherd became the lamb. He's not just the shepherd. He is also the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that same blood that, that protected the people of Israel is the same blood that protects us and that we are under the blood when we put our hope in Jesus. And so sometimes Christians talk about being under the blood. We talked about growing up. We talked about all the time we talk. And it, it sounds like well, under the blood. Like what? Well, it means that Christ sacrifice. He has done, he has protected us from death and has given us new life in his blood. So he is a shepherd who has become the lamb. And because of that, we can put our trust in him. We can put our trust in him. And so just as we conclude, I want to, I want to know, have you ever put your trust in Jesus, in the Lamb of God? And you, you can today. Today's parable ends with, with a note of repentance. It says they rejoiced when the sinners repented. And, and repent, is, again, another, another Bible word, but it means like just admitting that you have gone your own way, you've been doing your own thing, and you're turning and putting your trust in Jesus in his death and his resurrection. It's, it's acknowledging like, man, I have I've been putting my trust in myself, I've, I've, but I wanna put my trust in, in Jesus. And the Bible says, every sinner, Jesus says, for when a sinner repents, there is rejoicing Sit in the heaven. There is rejoicing in heaven. And if you wanna take that step today, you can, in, wherever you are, in your living room, your car, sitting at the kitchen table, maybe you're outside, maybe you're at a park, you can put your trust in Jesus today. Jesus. And when you do that, there is rejoicing in heaven. Imagine that, and we rejoice, we rejoice. Mm. Like there, there is nothing better. Like we've been talking about with our, our leadership team, getting ready to meet again, and like what, like what, what kind of church? What's it going to look like and what's important to us and what's the vision going to be? And like, we want to be a church where sinners are welcome and where we rejoice when they come to know Christ. And if, if today you want to put your hope in, in Jesus, let us know. Follow the link there in the comments. We want to help you take that, that next step as you follow Jesus. And then during, as we were worshiping today, um, I just felt like, so in, the, in this passage, the, the shepherd goes out, and it's Jesus who goes out. But we are also under shepherds. So at times we're sheep, and we'll switch metaphors, and yeah. at times we're shepherds, and we have been called to go after the one. We have been called to go out to bring in the one, the one who was lost. And, and so we, like, are, are we ready for that? Are we, are we searching? Are we listening to the Holy Spirit? So are we a people that, that's going? Or are we a people that, you know, just, you know, we're just comfortable in our, in our faith. We, we got a, maybe we have a decent job. Maybe we don't have a decent job, but we got yes. unemployment still coming in. We got the unemployment coming, still coming. Uh, we're just, we're just kind of comfortable. And uh, we, we want to be a place. I was there too. <laughs> yeah. I, left I was there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we want to be a place where people are welcome, where we're not sitting at the door just, you know, like, what are, what are they doing here? Like, who, who are they? But not just sitting at the door, but actively going out as under shepherds and bringing people to the shepherd, the good shepherd who has changed our lives who has made us come alive, who has changed everything, who has forgiven our past and made us new. That's the kind of church that I, that I hope we're going to be. Man. That I hope we're going to be. So let me, let me pray for us. Jesus, we are amazed at your grace for us, that you actively pursued us 
we were wandering, we were doing our own thing, turned our back on you. But you pursued us and you brought us in. And we thank you for that. And God, help us never to forget. Help us never to forget your grace. And help us to be able to extend that grace and that welcome to others. Got people who, maybe people we, we don't even like, if we're honest. Yeah. People that maybe annoy us or, but help us not keep this good news to ourselves. Mm. So God, would you go with us today? Would you go with us this week? Would you open up our eyes? May we, may we not be so busy to miss what you want to do in our lives and through us and in this neighborhood and through the Hills Church. God, we make ourselves available to you. So God, whatever you want to do, however you want to use us, yes, use us. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Close it out? Yeah, we'll close it out. We'll close it out. <laughs> Amen. Brothers and sisters, may the grace of God go with you. May the peace of God give you strength this week. But let us go. Let us take the hope of Christ with us this week. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, grace, mercy, and peace be with you. Also with you. Amen.